So hi everyone, um, welcome to this webinar. I'm Sophie McCulloch, archivist at the Cooperative Heritage Trust. And I'm going to be speaking to you today on publicity, propaganda and advertising in the cooperative movement. So just for a bit of introduction, um, I'm going to be talking through how the co-op movement publicised itself and put its message across through advertising and propaganda from the early days. And then I'm going to go up to about the beginning of the 1960s. Um, I'll explain why when I get to that bit. And for the purposes of this session, when I use the word propaganda, I'm giving that the meaning of concerned with principles or a cause which is something that I've taken from a gentleman called Fred Crowther in the 1920s but I will again there'll be a bit more on him on him later on so just for the benefit of those of you who maybe don't know much about the crop movement um, or who uh, would like to know a bit more I think we just have someone else joining in, a couple of people joining in. Hi to those people who, who have just joined. Can you hear me okay if you've just joined? Hello, just for those of you who just joined, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Hi. Um, just really quickly, I'm Sophie McCulloch, um, archivist at the Cooperative Heritage Trust, talking to you about propaganda and advertising in the cooperative movement. Um, I've just explained that I'm going to mute the participants for now, but then at the end I will unmute and we can have a discussion and I'm happy to answer any questions. Does that sound okay? Yeah, lovely. Thanks. Yeah, fine. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Okay. So just just to go a bit back a bit to the early co-op movement. So the Rochdale pioneers are commonly known for beginning the modern cooperative movement, and they set up, set out the co-op principles that we know today. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about them and about their backgrounds. Um, so, because it has a bearing on the kind of things that I'm going to be talking about later in the context of advertising and campaigns. So, the pioneers started their society in 1844 as a, in part, as a reaction to poor quality food and unfair labour conditions. So, food, food such as flour was often contaminated to make it last longer. So, they would do things like put flour and mix it up with chalk, or they would reuse tea leaves that had already been used to resell those and also um, often short um, measures were actually short as well and they would include packaging in the weight so of what they were buying so they would include if you were buying say for example a pound of tea they would include the packaging in that um, in that price as well so the pioneers set up their society and their principles which are known as Law first, as you can see on the screen, and they pledged to sell honest food at honest prices. And hopefully you can see how this is reflected in some of the advertising from the time. Okay, so here are a couple of early examples of advertising that show the consumer the advantage of purchasing goods and being a member of a co-op society. Um, these two adverts are both from a magazine called Wheat Sheaf and they're from the 1890s. And I think you'll see there's quite a contrast between the two because the the one on the left hand side is more, I mean you can't, there isn't really a message in that, it's quite aspirational, it's kind of two people having a nice cup of cocoa on their on their lawn or whatever and they're and it is more quite aspirational but the other one is a lot more to the point so it's okay you get your teas, always full weight without the wrapper. Okay. Going forward, apologies for the big stamp on the front of this pamphlet by the way, um, 
going forward a few years, we're in 1916 now. And just to say actually as well that all of the images, pamphlets, information you see here is all taken from the National Cooperative Archive. So going forward to, um, to 1916, a chap called Theodore Armstrong produced this pamphlet called Advertising and the Cooperative Movement. This is quite an interesting one because in this he kind of complains that there's no, none of the national sort of non-co-op newspapers contained any adverts for co-ops at all. But then he also says that some, some cooperators actually saw that as a good thing because they saw that advertising was what they saw as an economic waste. Um, and I think I was kind of taking that to mean that if he, if you have co-op principles and if you follow the co-op principles, then why would you need advertising? Because you would do that anyway. Um, although he does sum up by saying that cooperation is a movement of consumers and any publicity must ultimately benefit them. Um, I'm just going to actually read you a little bit from the end of this pamphlet. Just bear with me. Bear in mind that the war was still, was still on when he wrote this, but he's saying, Basically, the mission of the movement is not yet fulfilled, nor can it be while competition controls the bulk of the nation's trade. Trade may be won by advert advertisement and the winning is for no unworthy end. Cooperation has done much for the people. Let it publish the fact. Under the dangers of wartime, it has served them. Let the fact be proclaimed. So I think although he, he does argue for why you might not want to advertise, I think he also says that advertising is, is a good thing. So for the next couple of slides, I'm going to focus on one entity because it really shows you what the what the movement were trying to do in terms of their propaganda and publicity campaigns. And that is the Joint Propaganda Committee. And this was set up by the Cooperative Wholesale Society and the Cooperative Union. Um, just for those who who might not be aware, the CWS Co-op Wholesale Society was set up in 1863 in Manchester and its primary focus was the manufacture of goods to sell to retail co-op societies and the co-op union founded also in Manchester in 1869 was an advisory body that provided education training and guidance to other co-ops um, both of these were membership organizations and you could and other co-ops would, would join them. So in the late 1880s, discussion began to take place at the Co-op Union's annual congress about how best to organise a strategy for a propaganda campaign across all co-op societies. By this time, the Co-op Union had become quite a political voice and a debating platform for the movement. Going on a bit too far though. So the development of the of the Joint Propaganda Committee. Um, I, I did actually search and search through the archive to try and find a picture of the committee. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we do have one. So as part of their part of their purpose was to help co-op societies. Here's a picture of a co-op society. Um, so yeah, the purpose of the of the Joint Propaganda Committee was to train cooperative organisers and to initiate a national cooperative advertising scheme aimed at educating members in cooperative principles and they also conducted special campaigns on behalf of societies that needed assistance they helped them to arrange meetings in suitable places and also helped to set up new co-op societies and a bit later on they were also trying to be quite active in what were called cooperative deserts so basically areas of the country that didn't have a very big co-op presence or any at all really in there. Um, after the First World War, obviously there was a bit of, they weren't very active during the war, but then after that they kind of revived themselves and set up the first national campaign for the committee. So the first national campaign was launched in 1927 
and it was led by a chap called Fred Crowther, who was a lecturer teacher for the CWS. And its aim was to get more publicity for the movement, more trade for societies and a bigger demand on co-op products. He also wanted, I quote, national recognition of the movement as a great national organization of consumers whose interests it exists to serve and who can only secure adequate protection through membership of a consumers cooperative society. And just out of interest, Fred Crowther is the chap that is pointing up at the sign on the right hand side of the picture. So the first, first national campaign, as I said, that was 1927. And um, we have in the archive a set of notes for speakers. You can see the, the cover of it here. And this is what the co-op union produced to kind of really give people an idea of how so they could go out to the societies and kind of help them out. So just going through this. It goes through the purpose of the campaign, which I've sort of touched on. So it's more publicity for the movement, more members, more trade, bigger demand for the products. They then go on to talk about the origins of the crop movement, placing it going back to Robert Owen, back to the Rochdale pioneers, what the objects of the pioneers were, what they wanted to achieve. Then some statistics of what the pioneers then went on to achieve. Then they talk about the co-op movement as it was in 1927, so there's some more statistics there. The organisation of the movement, the co-op union and the co-op wholesale society. Advantages of membership, so they really had kind of figured out a way that, that what they kind of were hoping to achieve by this, by this campaign. And then, yeah, it talks about all the kind of journals that are available. And then at the end, they talk about the, the rights and needs of consumers. Again, it's touching on what it kind of keeps going back to is that the, the movement is, is all about the consumers. So after the first campaign in 1927, there was another one in the same year, and then a third one in 1929. And the 1929 campaign was a two week exercise with the focus being concentrate on cooperation. And again, it was to encourage new members, increase trade. Um, the propaganda committee also introduced what is called the 10 year plan in 1934, which was a long term effort to strengthen the movement in time for the centenary of the Rochelle pioneers, which was in 1944. So what I'm going to do now is just show you a few examples of, of adverts from different decades and just kind of talk you through what they are, uh, maybe a bit of compare and contrast, what they were trying to achieve, were they successful, and then we can perhaps discuss those at the end. So the first few are from, all from the 1890s, and then you've got a wheat sheaf advert here on the left hand side. And then an advert from the Scottish cooperator. So the crump soil sweets, again, it's a little bit more, I would say, aspirational. They don't really, the only kind of thing that's saying anything about the kind of values and principles is the wholesome, delicious and pure at the bottom of the page. And the Scottish cooperator is far, uh, slightly less subtle than that. So again, they're talking about that they don't sell paper at the price of tea, packet teas are guaranteed full weight without the wrapper. And this is something they put on, on the front of the newspaper as well for quite a few, quite a few issues. And then um, advert for the Crumpsall Biscuit Works. The Crumpsall Biscuit Works is actually the first biscuit factory in the UK to have an eight hour day. 
so they put that on a lot of their adverts and their and their packaging and things like this and then this one on the left hand side i do really like but i'm not sure what this type of advertise advert is called um so obviously it draws it kind of draws the eye in where it says stick to middleton jam but then it also kind of when you read between the lines it says stick up for your own principles and don't let yourself be drawn to practically condemn the course of action you took when you decided to invest your money at Middleton in building and equipping one of the finest factories in England where your employees are now making for you the best of jam. So what they're saying here is this is another thing that, that you would you see a lot in in adverts, especially for the CWS, is that so they're talking they're talking to the members of the thing, it's your factory, they're your products, it's your work. By being a member, you have a part of this. And um, the reason I actually called this this presentation It's All Yours is because that's the name of a promotional film from the mid 1950s, which talks about all of the cedar rest factories and just re reiterates that if because you are a member, you own a, a piece of the organization. And here's some from the same time, but again, these are slightly different and slightly more aspirational, I suppose, but don't really have the, the same message. So the soap one and for um, children's clothing. And then again, we're into the 1900s now. Um, so these are both from the Cop News, I think, and they are do you realise the CWS works are your works? Um, made under, and again, they're mentioning made under good labour conditions, well-paid labour for you as, as the member. 1910s again, so this is getting into the First World War now. You can see that they've made their adverts comply to the, the lighting order at the time. So they're saying that you're shoes that you have used your pedal polish on are so shiny that they are kind of breaking the blackout um, regulations and then talking about keeping corporations fully employed by buying co-op products so 1920s we have women's outlook and the umbrella advert is from um a magazine called the producer which is kind of an in-house magazine for the CWS. And then 1930s, this is Women's Outlook magazine. So this isn't actually advertising a specific product it's just kind of advertising the cws in general and it talks about pure foods best materials clean packaging full weight without wrapper fair treatment and full dividend look for the cws brand so i can you can kind of see here that even you're getting on for kind of nearly 100 years now from the rochelle pioneers that that message is still quite strong at least for the cws saying full weight without the wrapper and that they treat their employees fairly. So now we're in the 1930s, just a small case study here. This isn't more about advertising so much as, um, as you can see where it says what's in the name, um, the, a product name. So this is how the CWS kind of put its campaigns into action. So in the early 1930s, some private manufacturers were starting to impose a system of resale price maintenance whereby retailers had to sell a product at a price that was set by the producer or manufacturer and this meant that some trade associations actually didn't like co-op societies offering a dividend on their products so in 1933 radio manufacturers um, informed the CWS that they would no longer 
allow them to give dividend payments on their wireless sets. So in response, the CWS, and it didn't actually take them long, it only took them a few months, had brought out its own radio set and they called it Defiant, which kind of shows that they were saying, okay, well, if you're, if you're not going to let us stick to our principles and offer the dividend, we will make and manufacture our own radios. Um, and that continued for, for many years. They, they made televisions as well eventually. So just a, just a small case study there. And then a couple of examples of adverts from the 1940s, um, Women's Outlook, talking about Defiant Radio. And I noticed when I was looking at this, the way they have written dividend right through the, the title of it as well. And then of course, with what was happening in the rationing, they had to kind of work that into their, into their adverts as well. And then we get into the 1950s. So these are from the CWS magazine, Home magazine. <coughs> Excuse me. And as you'll be able to see from these, there isn't really anything about, I mean, if you'd never heard of the CWS, you wouldn't really know what, what they were and what they stood for. It was more kind of in a domestic sort of, more domesticated, more focused on the actual products rather than rather than the message. Um, so most of the most of the adverts that we have in the archive from around that time look like that. And then sixties and seventies again, similar thing. I I chose this Crumpsall one and um, to compare it to the previous one because. The, the one from the 1800s, obviously talking about the factory conditions and that kind of thing, but that this one, this one doesn't really have that same message anymore. So methods of advertising. Um, obviously, one of the main the main things was advertising in. Print, um, there were lots and lots of journals associated with the movement. There's just a few here. So there's the Cop News, um, and that was the, the kind of main, and is still the kind of main newspaper for the, for the movement. Um, Women's Outlook, which is a women's magazine that was produced by the Cop Press. Um, and the Millgate Monthly, which is more kind of art and culture focused. And then another way this is um, for advertising was to use window displays. And in the late 1930s, um, the Colt Union, as part of their national propaganda campaign, um, would hold competitions. So different societies could, and you can see this one is, is fairly elaborate, different window displays, and they would they would hold competitions um, to see who who had the best one, but I think it was quite a quite a good way of encouraging the societies to get involved and also making sure that the the produce has was attractive to the consumer and it was it was quite a good advertising tactic really. Um, there's another one here. Um, this is another. Prize winning display. This is the Bursland Co op Society from the, from the 1940s. Oh, and the Co op Union also had um, awards for societies. So they did this in, I think, mostly in the 1950s, the advertising awards. So they, and they had different categories such as booklets, catalogues, newspapers, handbills, and letterheads. And here is a, an example of a winner of the advertising awards. This is the Brightside and Carbrook Co-op Society from 1954. And yeah, I think it um, gets the message across quite well of what they were what they were wanting to do. And then we go into TV, television commercials. 
and the CWS was among the first businesses to advertise on the newly established independent television network or ITN as we know it now when it began broadcasting in the London region in 1955. Now the cost of these adverts actually gave the cost a thousand pounds a minute which although at the time it was considered very high priced it was felt that it still the kind of the value kind of outweighed outweighed the cost. Um, the Cedar West provided special window and counter displays. They were offered to societies to tie into that promotion. So I'm actually on the next slide. I'm going to show you show you the advert, the 1955 advert. Spot the likeness. Um, I hope you can all hear it okay. Um, just a small disclaimer: in 1955, it is very very of its time. So. I'm going to put that on now. Probably. And you spot the likeness. See why these three ladies are alike. Just look at them one at a time. Mrs. Jones playing gets on course. At home, her cooking wins the floor. For flaky pastry, old of our, she uses plain federation flour. Housekeeping costs are going down. For less attendant Mrs. Brown, still praising Federation Farm, and so her sponges always rise. Miss Smith sells fruit, and when she bakes, the mixed dried fruit she buys for cakes and pudding is TWS. For value, flavor, cleanliness. Did you spot the likeness? Here's Mrs. Jones with Federation Flame Flour. Mrs. Brown with Federation Self Raising Flour. Miss Smith with TWS Mixed Fruit. They're alike because they're all left handed. Of course, they all buy TWS flour and food at their co-op as well, but that's too easy. Everyone who wants the best insists upon TWS, mark of a thousand good things. Okay, that, that is was Spot the Likeness. So the Court News um, in September 1955 reported on the on the new advert and this is this is obviously the article, but um, in the article it states that ITV will be broadcast for the first time on the 28th of September 1955, and the CWS advert will be shown within the first week that the channel was broadcast. The advert was said to have all the attraction of a panel game, and that was a quote from the CWS publicity manager at the time, who's in the picture there, Frank Churchwood. Um, it also again it talks about the high cost of advertising, but the CWS had actually booked quite a lot of slots for the advert, quite far in advance, um, and also far enough advance for when the station was actually rolled out to Birmingham and Manchester. And just out of interest, the narrator on that advert is Patrick Allen, who was quite a well-known TV presenter and voiceover actor. And then, And then just to show you, this was a, a kind of internal document which shows how um, they're trying to kind of put across the value of, of TV advertising. It shows all the times that it's that it will be shown on the TV. So that is kind of brings me to the end of of my uh, presentation. So I wanted to kind of show you how. Advertising was just up to the kind of beginning of the 1960s. Um, just because after that, there was a lot of rebranding, a lot of kind of unification of the movement. Um, so thank you for listening. If you want to get in contact with the archive, you can do so here. And then I will open it up to questions. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. Has the time to be um, politely quiet to let someone else jump in finished so I can ask a question? Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Um, just, 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 um, just uh, pause this, because I can see everyone else on the side. So hello oh. to the um, people who've got the cameras on. Um, Pauline, I'm not sure if you were aware, but we saw you doing some mechanics. Um, you're obviously getting a bit um, sort of uncomfortable sitting in your chair at some point. So it's quite interesting. I was kind of wondering where the backing track was coming from for your 
your dance routine. Um, but my, uh, my, my questions on this, um, I, it strikes me this is, this, I mean, I've looked at bits of the archive myself in terms of advertising and promotion um, for things over the years. So the It's All Yours advert for the 50s, I think is a really, I'd commend anyone to and not want yeah. to stand salute the national anthem at the end because it's just hugely patriotic in, in many ways yeah but um in some ways i just wonder there's, there's two things really one is um are we starting to come full circle again so some of those early campaigns which were about educating people as to the nature of cooperative businesses and why they were inherently a better model so the umbrella sheltering from capitalism yeah was a few years ago we saw cooperatives uk have a big national campaign called the cooperative option, which is all about trying to re-educate people as to this different model of business. So is, do we think, uh, so is kind of cooperative propaganda something that goes through cycles? But then also, um, I was just wondering if through the archive, you'd been able to compare and contrast with other models of cooperatives as well. So for example, worker co-ops, although they'd be much yeah. more localized in yeah. their advertising, would probably be much more politically orientated. Yes around other campaigns so whether there's anything about where as a movement we've also connected our advertising messages with other social um, themes of the day as well i think definitely in terms of things like the producer and worker car they do have you know that kind of message that that you were talking about um i think one of the the disadvantages of only having an hour is that um there's a lot more that i could that i could say um so yeah but I do think you're right in that I think it has definitely come full circle now. I think more people understand what a co-op is and what, what they do and that kind of thing. Whereas maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from personal memory here in the 80s and 90s. I don't think people did know that, but I think this is definitely, it is definitely coming back around now, I think, yeah. Can I, can I speak now? Can you hear me? Yeah, um, it's a, you're breaking up a little bit, but yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, it, it, it's Pauline here. It's my first ever webinar, folks. Okay, um, mine, too, mine too. So An, in, an interesting experience and great, because I've got a leg injury, which explains why <laughs> I, I was moving around. And I didn't, uh, even know if you could, I didn't even realize if you could see me or not, but not to worry. Um, and I am not a member of the co-op college, but I'm interested in, in all of its work. Okay. And, and I, I don't agree. I, I, I don't think people, um, there isn't a consensus at the moment at all about what co-ops are. And in actual fact, uh, look, I live in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire, mm -hmm. and I'm interested to sort of meet other people who might want to start um, something in the community together. And mm -hmm. I've been to various meetings that have been advertised as um, new co-ops setting up. And to be frank, what they have been so far is um, people who have been employed by uh, National Health Service or local authorities whose jobs are no longer there, which is you know a shame, mm. but basically wanting to set up what they call co-ops. And I guess I can only understand what they mean by that is some kind of worker co-op. In other words, we yeah. want to create jobs for ourselves. Um, okay. My passion is user-led initiatives and community development projects. And, and I think that <laughs> in an ideal world, in my ideal world, that's what co-ops are and or should be. Um, so looking at the history of it, I had, had been to the Rochdale Museum many years ago. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was a great thing, but, but very much set up by people who wanted to sell stuff albeit good products you know um and as a kid you know my mum and dad like we bought stuff from the co-op and we supported it but yeah. it wasn't it wasn't what i suppose i'm wanting rightly or wrongly from the co-op movement as well the current movement particularly is more of a, a true user-led initiative where people who are um receiving goods or services can be in control of how they're distributed, pr produced, whatever. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I don't think there's consensus at all. 
In fact, I think the opposite. I think at the moment there are extremes and lots of people are scrabbling yeah. to set up co-ops to keep the same old thing going, if I'm honest. Right. Uh, just, to, just to jump in briefly there, Paul, I think that's a really um, kind of current issue. It's something I've seen over the last few years is... Sorry, you know, I didn't catch your name. I'm new to all this. What was your name again? Oh, sorry, I'm Adrian. I can't see on screen who's speaking, so it's just because I'm out. I've not done it before, I think. Oh, okay. okay. Hi, Adrian. Hello. Um, so, I, over the last few years, I've kind of aware that there's been a lot of political interest from the state in cooperative models, and we've started to see lots of uh, initiatives, pathfinder programs from people like the NHS, Ministry of Justice, Cabinet, yeah. at a national level, and then also mirrored in some ways at local authority levels to create to almost um, adopt a cooperative identity. So for example, cooperative councils are a huge network now, but actually they don't really fit very well with the International Cooperative Alliance's definition of a cooperative in terms yeah. of some of the democratic elements. However, that aside, I think you're right, what it, your, your experiences, Pauline, highlight, highlight is that there is a lot of confusion and there's a lot of reinterpretation. And if we're not careful, then um, we, we will start to have a very muddled sector. And this is why having yeah. strong propaganda is so important in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I think people are hijacking. I think people are trying to hijack, or, or successfully hijacking actually, um, which is just such a shame. I, I, and I would like to be involved in trying to prevent that and trying to, uh, just trying to promote what, well, having said that though, it's what I understand co-operas are. And I, I realise that everybody agrees with me, but I'm, as I say, it's the user-led stuff that is where I'm coming from, totally. Have you got a dog? Yes, sorry. Uh, it's <laughs> oh, it's all right. No, it's nice. It's nice having a dog on a webinar. A dog, a dog, a dog, a dog in our. <laughs> yes, so welcome. So in terms of the College Centennial webinars, this is the first time you've been joined by a rescue greyhound. Oh, hi. <laughs> well, waiting for the dog. <laughs> Um, Pauline, have you heard of the Member Pioneer Network? I was going to mention that. Yeah. No. No. Well, I'm a new member of staff, new to co-ops. It's a completely, it was a, com like you were saying, I don't think people did know what co-ops really were. And I'm only just getting into it now, having been in a new role with the co-op group since May as um, a Member Pioneer Coordinator. Um, and what we've got now is a network of member pioneers, one in every community of the UK doing, it's, it doesn't sound like a lot, but just like the 1% going back into the local fund from the shop doesn't sound a lot as well. It still makes a difference. Um, four hours a week. So these member pioneers are being employed by the co-op to feed back into the community. And that very much is user-led. That's about them living. They have to live in the area where they're a member pioneer. They have to know their community. They have to get their ear to the ground, get forums together um, and ask the community <coughs> what their priorities are. And then they work on that along three very broad themes. So I don't know if that's something that would fit into your idea of what a true cooperative is, um, but that's what the cooperative group are doing at the moment. And I do feel, but then it's difficult to compare because I've never been a part of um, a cooperative before and I didn't really know much about cooperative history. Um, I knew little bits, but I'd not really been involved directly. Um, but of course I am now because I'm employed into that role. And I feel that a lot more of it is becoming obvious now. And I think with the branding, the adverts on telly, it's what we do, all those things. The presence I think is being um, exaggerated again. So people will, will notice it. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's my experience. Well, I've, I've, been, I've been a worker in it. Well, I've been a worker in lots of different organisations, and a volunteer and an unpaid worker in many. Um, and I've been I've been a worker in an organisation, supposedly a co-op years ago, and that but that was based on the principle of everybody was on the pay same pay scale, etc. Which is, I guess I'm a bit purist about stuff, so I thought that was an okay model. In terms of the co-op, I mean, come on, in terms of branding. And I'm not quite sure, by the way, just because of my, just because I don't, I don't know when you say you're employed by the co-op, do you mean the co-op 
cooperative yeah. group. The national, the national, yeah. So of course we've got a, we've got a bit of a damage limitation exercise on our hands, haven't we? I mean, I like I shop at my local co-op yeah. whenever I can, and and when I'm in other places, and I gab to people all the time, like on the street or at bus stops. Yeah. Start talking to people about the co-op, and you know we know we know the recent history, which yeah. is just atrocious for the co-op, the co-op bank, etc. Mm. Uh, and I think, I think a bit of brand. We need a lot more than a bit of branding to reclaim um, and uh, and restate and re-engage people that did 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 get, believe in the co-op and the, and the divvy. You know the divvy. That was what like was like the magic thing, wasn't it? About the work shopping at the co-op and you got your divvy each year. When yeah. that was withdrawn without consultation, it just did so much damage. Mm. Um, but but I'm very pro cooperative working, true cooperative working. But like as Adrian was saying, um, and I've tried to engage, I've tried to get people to be involved in setting up or you know or join what I what I understand the co-op is, and I'm struggling. I'm struggling to find people that are doing what I believe is a co-op that are really, really into it and that don't want to spend a load of time and energy on the branding, to be frank, because we're in an age of overload of information and overload of branding. I think how we do things and how we act and behave in itself should be the brand, is the branding if, that I think works. So yeah. I, and I will have a look, I'll look, I'll have a deco, um, I'll Google. Mm -hmm. about about the member pioneer network yeah there might be some roles advertised as well if you fancy it i'm not sure in in your area what's what's available but they're still recruiting at the moment i'm much more interested in um co-ops at sort of local levels but true co-ops and not replacements not not as not co-ops which are being used as an exit strategy from um health trusts and local authorities like Adrian was saying before, and, that, and that's sadly what I've experienced locally. Um, even more sadly, a lot of the people at the top are also very active members of the Labour Party and doing a lot of branding around the Labour Party. Um, and that saddens me even more. But that's a different conversation, sorry. Different webinar, I suppose. I was just going to say, Pauline, it might be useful, I don't know if you have already, but have a look on Co-ops UK's website, which is uk.coop. And they have yeah, a big... I'm aware of Co-op UK because I've, I've yeah. worked in the community for many years and done various fund fundraising Just to say they have a very good directory of co-ops so you can go in and find... Yeah, I've looked. In... Yeah, oh, I've looked. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Like, like I say, I'm still struggling to, and I'm a good huntress, I'm still <laughs> struggling to find... Um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying they're, all, they're not there, I'm just saying I've not found them yet. I um, think... That, that maybe raises another interesting sort of dimension to this idea of propaganda, where as a movement, historically, and to an extent currently, we push out messaging globally into the you know, kind of, a, sort of elephant gun approach across all yeah. media worlds. But then how do we connect that up? The challenge is how we connect that up with the local independent co-ops. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I know in the sort of 80s and 90s, I was working with a lot of worker co-ops, housing co-ops, credit unions, and so on. And if we uh, introduced ourselves as a co-op, they'd say, oh, but you're not that high street shop. Mm -hmm. There was that confusion between how we get the propaganda. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This is the philo this is a philosophy of a business model, but it's not just this one business. It's the whole family of things. Um, mm -hmm. It's an element of the, the, the propaganda, which... Um, has been a has, has been a struggle, um, and maybe historically we've not, when there were lots of independent societies all advertising across each other. You know, this is nothing new for us, and maybe as with so ma many other things, the answers in our history and yeah, the, the archives there to be mined and to kind of have more stories to tell us. Yeah. And draw on to think about how we do things. Yeah. Next. Because we're almost. Well, like that. But like, 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 uh, like we've shown from what we've just seen, it, it, it's gone in waves, hasn't it? Like the, the, the political message was there in, I, think, I can't remember them all now, but the umbrella, it was, it was overt in, and the values came over very loud and clear in a few of them, but there was waves over the decades and, and then it just became more like, oh, buy this soap or whatever. Mm. So maybe we just need to put the politics back into the court. 
movement and be more be, be upfront more about what how political it is. I think it is very political, the idea of a co-op in a good way. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions, observations? Um, just maybe just add in as speaking as someone who studied marketing and advertising in one of my university degrees. Yeah. Um, we were never exposed to values led advertising, uh, history of advertising like that. So right. no, these webinars are recorded. So I kind of encourage the college to say any colleges, teaching schools, academies, whatever you've got contact with to do media or things, then push this and encourage them to stick it on their, their teaching mm -hmm. because it really does open up some interesting avenues. Again, it's part of that propaganda. Yeah. yeah. Winning hearts. Yeah, we do get the odd student coming into the archive, but then usually universities, but yeah, I think it's definitely that we could, we could have more of those for sure. Okay, well, if no one has any other questions, I shall leave it there. And uh, thank you for joining and, and listening and I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful.